Theater Drama Club members, fans, friends, and family, welcome to episode 17 of Goshen Theater Drama Club Table Talks. We're here today with our regular panel. That's me, Miss Amber. You know me. Hello. The beautiful Miss Molly, live from right here in Goshen, Indiana. Hello, Molly. How are you? I am good. <laughs> How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm living on coffee today. Yup, yup. We also, oh, there we go. Hey, uh, we're also joined by Miss Katie, our regular panelist extraordinaire, Goshen Theater Drama Club Summer Program Director. How are you, Miss Katie? Just peachy. How are you? You're good. We've already established that you're good. Yeah. What if I gave a different answer? That's what we should do from now on. <laughs> Next week. We're really challenging our acting skills. Keep it fresh. Ooh, ooh, improv. Uh, so where are you at today, Miss Katie? I'm still in Michigan. Well, that's exciting. I had a little car trouble this week when I went to go back to Chicago to pack up things at my apartment, and uh, so I got to stay. <laughs> that's uh, one thing about being an actor, kids, is that you're always having car trouble because you have to buy a used car. Uh, yeah. So always having or that. if you're really I, lucky, you have one that just stays with you for many a years. There you go. Yes, Paul. I do not have car trouble. That's because you have no car. I was just say New York. <laughs> I got 99 problems, but a car ain't one. And here, live from New York City, Paul Regano, without an automobile. How are you today, Paul? Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, what can I say? Wow. That's a change. <laughs> <laughs> this is my generally gruff demeanor. Yes, indeed. <laughs> City exterior. Yeah, very stoic. Yeah. So t today, episode 17, our topic is uh, dedicated to our back to school time that we are in right now. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about all of the educational things and things that you learn that aren't dramaing while you're doing theater. Uh, and we're not obviously going to talk about all of them. We're going to, we have a few on our list. If you can think of some more, drop those in the comments for us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm supposed to say that because we're on YouTube. That's how you're supposed to do it. Uh, but if you haven't tuned into our show before, the way this works is we start our episode off with a hot take or an audience question, uh, and then we dive right in to the regular topic. Today's hot take, this one is one for the ages. Since the founding, since 1776, this has been the great debate. It is, do you spell theater, E-R, or do you spell theater, R-E? Hot takes. Katie, are you an E-R person or an R-E person? I tend to stick to R-E. I'm fancy like that. Um, but I was also told at some point in my life that E-R was like for a movie theater. And then RE is for, you know, like our type of theater. So um, I just, I, rule of thumb, I just go RE. I, I like that you, like, you tried not to say legitimate theater. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just, all right, look. <laughs> theaters are legitimate. Yeah. What they are. Right? Sure. Yeah. It's a legitimate performance. Amber, don't you, uh... Do you, do you run a movie theater? I, mm. <laughs> she has a theater that does movies, Paul. There's a difference. As a service to the community, we occasionally show film, yes. Well, well done. Thank you. <laughs> Molly, E-R-R-E, what's your hot take? I personally spell it with R-E. However, when I was interning with Amber, I sent a plethora of emails and entered lots of data that was ER. So sometimes I find myself typing ER subconsciously. And so now I'm just, I'm a little confused. I've got to be honest. <laughs> I <Yeah>. see both sides. <laughs> I, as usual. I think as I <laughs> last 30 seconds of this table talk was like a perfect encapsulation of, it was this entire series in a nutshell. It was, Amber posing a very erudite question. Katie 
uh, giving a very clear-cut answer of why she feels a certain way, Paul making a snarky remark, Amber taking him to task, and Molly saying, can't we all just get along? It was... <laughs> we hope this is... That a- is our dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if this is your first time tuning in, that's all you need to know, basically. We just did a recap without <laughs> even knowing it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Paul, E-R-R-E? Um, you know, <clears throat> what's weird is that I spell favorite without a U <laughs> and honor and color. 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 And, uh, and I say schedule instead of schedule and all of that, but... Al- aluminium. Aluminium, yes, but I, uh, but I spell theater with an R E the British way, mm-hmm. and I don't know why. There's here's the thing. There's no other American um, etymological trend of E R versus R E for endings that I know of. Center. So like, whereas favorite color honor those are that the ou would send the soul searching to do i it makes sense to me that i should use er that that's the american way to do it but I, i've been already my whole life and that's just that's all i know i that i feel that it is right so i've heard the theory that we spell theater re because theater itself is a british english european english art form I mean, there are many who would uh, disagree with that assessment. <laughs> Anyone who did Drama Club Summer Program? I started to say, hopefully our campers. <laughs> did our history unit. They know that's not true. Well, musical theater yes. is, is an American art form. Absolutely. Yes. So is, is straight drama or is that theater with an R-E and musical theater with an E-R? I don't know. Musical theater. <laughs> you just said that. It's theater. <laughs> but cinema, okay. cinema is an American entertainment, so that's why doing movie theater ER makes sense to people. But yeah, when I am typing out the word, unless it is the name of the venue that I work at, I'm an RE person. Hundred percent of the time. So yeah, I don't know. I feel like it makes me feel. This is so stupid, but spelling it re makes me feel more in touch with the roots of my art form. It's dumb, it's dumb, but uh, you know, there it is. Okay, but I've done I've done shows where I've been playing in the pit, and we've not been under the stage, or we have not been like visible in any way we've been like down the hall in another room and piped into the theater and yeah. i still wear my black because it makes me feel connected to a deep story tradition of pit musicians so i get that right like the building that i'm in right now facilitates uh the fact that i cannot say the name of a scottish shakespeare play but molly because she's at home could say the name of that play, but because it's coming out of a speaker here in my building, is that still bad luck? Maybe we should do a deep dive on the myths of theater. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the superstitions. <laughs> or the superstitions, yeah. Jerry, come in here. Jerry! Hey, everybody, say hello to Jerry. Hi, Jerry! Hi, Jerry! Hello, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Don't say the M word. Don't say the M word. Jerry, no offense, but I thought you were going to be a different Jerry, and it's very nice to meet you, but I am slightly disappointed by your presence. <laughs> is, it, is it a Jerry that I might know? Isn't... Jerry O'Boyle? Yes, I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not him. I was wondering. I'm sure you're lovely, though. I don't know. Well, I, sometimes I try and sometimes I don't. <laughs> Jerry, you should co-host uh, Table Talk at some point. Uh, yeah. Apparently, I should. <laughs> so, Jerry, our hot take today, the topic is, do you spell theater with an E-R or do you spell theater with an R-E? Okay, so 
I, um, at, at Goshen College, the previous um, um, director there was convinced that RE was British and that the ER was American. So if it's in the US, we spell it ER. Uh, but I, I don't know, I kind of wish the art form was RE and the building was ER. Or, I like that. Or something to that effect. I like that. Uh, Taking it home, Jerry <laughs> Peters. Everybody, a hand for Jerry Peters. Yeah, Thanks thank for joining us for Table Talk yes, today. Yes. Thank you. All thank right. you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao Bella. Grazie. Okay. Yay, Jerry. So I feel like we just got a letter on Mr. Rogers or something. Like, we just had a guest appear. <laughs> Mr. Jerry. New segment of hot takes. Jerry. <laughs> Let's take it to Jerry in the office. Uh, Jerry. It's Ari. Great. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, Molly, say it again. Oh, you're right. I was just going to say that hot take was so much deeper than I ever thought it could be. <laughs> Leave it to us. Then I remembered who I was talking to, so. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my goodness. All right, folks. Well, we're moving into the main part of our episode today. It's about things that you learn while you're doing drama that aren't drama. And, well, there'll be a title. When you see this, there'll be a title. It'll be better than what I just said. Oh, my goodness. It's a phone call. We'll get them later. <laughs> wow, it's a lot today, isn't it? So, it's about, go ahead. But no, it, it's the joke is already the moment's passed. Forget it. <laughs> it's this kind of scintillating content that you tune into the drama club table talks for. <laughs> Never mind, the moment's passed. You were talking about what we should title the episode because we don't technically have one, and I was thinking. Something along the lines of Goshen Theater Table Talk 17, Electric Boogaloo. Done. Not a it's joke. Kind of <laughs> it's happening. Great. <laughs> so uh, we have a list of things that are secondary learning objectives that you will learn from doing drama. I think one of the things that uh, is kind of a misconception about theater is that it's something that you do for fun. You get up in front of people and you learn the skills of being on stage and like public speaking and all that stuff. That stuff's kind of obvious. We know that you guys are gonna learn those things from doing shows and they're great. Those things are amazing. Like you learn how to sing, dance, act, all that stuff. You do like team building, you make friends. That's great. That's the stuff that everybody thinks about. But there are so many other things that you will learn from doing shows. And we're just gonna talk about a few of them today and maybe some examples from our own lives of ways that we have learned and applied those sort of non-primary, secondary things that we learn in theater. The first one we're gonna talk about today is creativity. And boy, oh boy, theater gives you so many opportunities for creativity because you wanna create illusions of amazing things, but you're not actually going to, like if you had to build a Maltese falcon or a golden calf. You're not gonna get an actual gold cow. You're gonna find a way to make that cow gold and you're gonna have to be creative about it. What are some examples of creative problem solving the things you guys have done in shows where you've really learned creativity through doing theater? Paul, you start. Great. Um, so when I was, this actually, I mean, so creativity is a big part of um, my role in the theater in general because what I do is create, um, among other things. But but one of the big things I do is make something out of nothing, in, in a sense. Um, so we were doing a show. Um, it, it doesn't matter where it was. It was a fundraising performance gala thing, and we were a few minutes short of our time slot. We knew the morning of, we had, we had a rehearsal and we said, we're coming in a few minutes short. Um, we need one more song. What else can we do? There were three of us. It was myself, my brother, and one singer. And we were brainstorming. We were thinking it was maybe 11 or noon the day of. Uh, and David looks at me and he goes, I mean, we could write a new song. And the singer goes, ha, 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 yeah. And I said, ha, yeah. 
And then I started playing something and we started figuring something out. And by one o'clock, not even, we had a new song. It was short, it was a short song, but the title of the song was literally another song. Um, and it, it was all about like, do you really want us to do one more? And it was, it's fun and it's cute. And one of my uh, favorite achievements in the theater in that it, it um, almost took longer to write than it, or almost took, takes longer to perform than it did to write. Um, it's, I mean, it's not a, a, a complex or, you know, incredibly difficult song, but um, very proud of it. That the, Those are the kind of things that I learned in, in the theater is thinking on your feet uh, and is understanding. So within that creativity, like you think like I have nothing and by tonight I need to have something completely new. <clears throat> and if you're, th you know, if when you're improvising, um, when I'm talking with improvising students, I frequently say, uh, if you look out and around you, or if you go inward into your mind, where do you think you'll find more ideas? And obviously into the mind, you'll have way more because it, it's just an infinite number of possibilities inside your brain. You come up with giraffes wearing top hats and whatever else, because it's, there are no rules. It's, whereas the, the work you're in, the situation that you're in and the surroundings that you are surrounded by um, are finite and are specific and that's what makes good theater and that's something that i learned uh in my training what makes good theater um but so we took the situation we were in and we extrapolated from that this idea and by that evening we debuted a new song which is pretty cool Yeah, that's really fun. The cool thing is like how theater forces you to be creative because if you've invited people to things and they're going to show up and sit there, you got to have something. So if something's not working, you got to like make it happen. Molly, what about you? What's some like, what's a story where you learned some creativity? Yeah, I, I was trying to think, I don't know if I have like a specific moment or like a specific something that happened in the show, but one of the things that I love being a choreographer that I'm like, beginning to love even more and more first choreography was something for me I was like oh like this is a skill that I can do so I'm happy to do that in a situation where I'm asked to um but now I like I'm really starting to fall in love with it which is really cool um and this this kind of goes along with I think another point we're going to talk about later so I apologize if I'm adding in and out but for me like creativity and collaboration go hand in hand um and one of the things I love about doing choreography is actually production meetings. When you're with the music director, the director of the show, the scenic designer, the sound designer, me, the choreographer, you all have these specific areas where you're bringing your own creativity. But for me, I like so, so many ideas are sparked in my mind when I listen to other people talk about their ideas. Like, oh, musically, I would love for this to happen here. And because someone else had that creative idea, it really sparks my creativity. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about theater is that it isn't just you like at the end of the day it's so creative because it's so many people coming together to ha uh, create one goal and kind of share one vision um, especially when you have a team that everyone just really respects each other's ideas and wants to make the best show possible um, I think that that's always a really awesome experience and that inspires me and that's like what makes me want to do choreography more because I didn't realize how much I like being a part of the vision. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's my, my, my thoughts. <laughs> I love it. Miss Katie, what do you think? So I kind of went in a different direction. I'm going to tell a little bit of story about when I was a child in school. Um, so I grew up in a town where there weren't a whole lot of, uh, drama club experiences, right? We had like our little sing stations choir, which was like our elementary show choir, which I was a part of. And then like I did skits at church for like Easter and stuff. So um, in the third grade, we were learning how to put together an oral book report. And I had read a book about Florence Nightingale. If you don't know her, she's really cool. Um, she ended up being a nurse in one of the big wars. <laughs> and I did my oral book report. I basically did, um, I became the character. I acted my book report out. So like had a costume. I dressed like I was Florence Nightingale and then I had props involved. 
<laughs> and I did a British accent. And my third grade teacher to this day, if she sees me out and about her, she sees my mom, she always will stop you and bring out that oral book report. She's never seen anything like it. It was like watching a little actress is what she'll say, blah, 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 blah. That was an example where I found my theater creativity that helped me in school. Fast forward to my sophomore year of high school. I am in an honors world history class. My teacher is one of the toughest teachers you will ever meet on this planet. I, let me preface this with she's an amazing teacher and I love her so much, but she is tough, all right? And going in as a, a sophomore, we were scared to death in our class because we are the honors kids of our class. We are the top of our class. And the classes that had gone before us, like the, the juniors uh, that we knew, had told us specifically, there's this really hard project you're going to do right off the bat. And you're going to hate it. And everyone's going to fail it. And here's what you should choose because you have all these different things that you can choose to do with it. Here's what you should choose because here's what everybody in our class failed at. So one of the choices was make a game board based on like the slave trade of the world. Um, another would be to create like a journal basically of, of someone who was on the ships of the slave trade, blah, 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 blah. And there was like one other option. When I originally got the project, I wanted to do the journaling because that's where my strengths lie. I, I can write things. And then like, if I want to present that as an oral thing, it was supposed to be even more points right up my alley. Right. I've already done this a million times in classes. But because the older classmen said that in their group, nobody got good grades on that, they steered us clear of that. They told us, don't do that. You will fail. And I let my academics scare me out of doing it. And I created a game board. And it was fine. It was, it existed. It was boring. It wasn't something special. It's nothing that stood out. And I did not get a good grade. And as an honors kid, that really messed with my mind. And so I went in with a meeting to my teacher and I was like, I don't like, is there anything I could have done better? Like, it's just like, Katie, you're a drama kid. I said, yeah. She's like, you're an actor. And I said, yeah. She's like, why didn't you do the journaling project? And I said, uh, well, the juniors told us that everyone got bad grades last year and told us we shouldn't do it. And she's like, you're an actor. That's where your strengths lie. Why would you not play to your strengths? And I said, I got scared. And she's like, you won't again. And I have it. So uh, big lesson, play to your strengths. And if you're a, a theater kid in school right now, one of your strengths is going to be performing. One of your strengths is going to be storytelling. It, if you're an actor on the aspect, right? But even then, if you're a designer kid, you still have the ability to, to tell a story. Um, so look for the way to take drama and put it into your class projects because you will be playing to your strengths every time. Yeah, so my story, creativity. I'm so glad, Katie, that I'm not the only one who assumed a character for an oral report because in, in ninth grade, I, uh, yeah, dressed up as and presented a report about Molly, Bob Fosse, <laughs> as, as Bob Fosse. Yes! I would, I would buy tickets to that show. Me too! <laughs> it was something it. else. That's awesome. <sighs> Uh, like literally I'm working on an oral report about Betsy Ross right now. I mean, I wouldn't call it that, but basically what it is, it's like the grown up version, the grown up theater version of an oral report. <laughs> so there is that. Uh, creativity is one of those skills that'll help you in your regular life that you can learn from theater and that theater is one of the best ways to learn it. But just as Miss Katie said, you can apply it now. You don't, it's not something like, oh, I'm learning this now and then I'm going to wait 20 years and after I do all these things in my career, then I'll be more creative. No, you can apply that creativity now. And doing theater makes your brain think in a different way. So I think that, uh, I think it's important to remember that if you are, like, if you're doing it, you are fostering this creativity in yourself now, which is so cool. Um, Cause we had some creative kids this, this summer at Goshen Theater Drama Club, like crazy creative. And uh, you guys came up with amazing stuff. So we know you already are developing that creativity but uh, you can never be too creative. The next one we're gonna chat about is confidence. I know that I had some trouble as a younger person being confident in who I was and uh, really 
being like having the ability to put myself out there. Uh, the first audition I ever did, you guys, I didn't want to sing in front of people. Like, and it, I was so sheepish about doing it. I was eight. Uh, I was so sheepish about doing it that I didn't get a big part in the little show that we were doing because I was so scared because it was something, it was so high stakes for me. Like I wanted it so bad. I had this dream so much that like that was hard. So I had to develop the courage to actually do it. And I think you develop confidence by actually doing stuff. So what's, what's a time, Molly, that you learned confidence through theater? Uh, I'm going to go back to choreography because I feel like a lot of these things apply. I, I definitely consider myself an actor first, but in terms of some of these skills, I actually feel like some of them I've learned more recently in the last year because of doing choreography. Um, I was honestly terrified the first time I had to run a rehearsal as a choreographer and teach people a dance that I created. Um, I felt a lot of imposter syndrome. I didn't feel like I was worthy, that the dance would be good enough, that I would teach it well enough, that it would look good, that it would ever be good enough. Um, and I don't know, there's something that happens for me when I actually get into the rehearsal atmosphere and start teaching and everything just starts happening. And honestly, I, in once I'm like within that moment, I'm not thinking about anything else. And I think it's one of the only times in my life that I don't have anything else on my mind when I'm really in the moment of a rehearsal. I, I was weirdly thinking about this this morning because I had a rehearsal this morning and it's not that I wasn't looking forward to it, but I, I got that late and I was tired and part of me was like I hope I'm prepared enough for this rehearsal because I also am kind of a perfectionist and sometimes if I feel like I'm not ready to do something that it's not going to be good enough um but as soon as I started just teaching the stance and being in that rehearsal space like everything else was gone and I felt extremely content and extremely happy and I think for me another part of confidence is like when I was growing up um, I've always been outgoing, but I think there was a part of me that was like scared about certain things, um, as a lot of people are, especially when you're younger. For me, in, in my mind, confidence was something that if you were a different type of person and had a different type of personality, you probably had confidence. But I think that there's a big distinguishing factor between like just having confidence in yourself, like who you are. You don't have to be a different type of person to be confident. You have to be confident in what makes you different. Uh, so yeah, that's what that made me think of. But it, I, I feel like my confidence has grown a lot since graduating school uh, because I'm realizing that I am a professional in this field and I have the training and I have the skills to do it. And it's really empowering. Uh, yeah. Like a healthy confidence, not like a weird ego, you know, but. Oh, we gotcha. There's a difference yeah. between confidence and arrogance. Uh, yes. But uh, I'm going to put something that you said on like a t-shirt or a mug or something. Maybe it's next year's like drama club slogan. It's, you don't have to be a different kind of person to be confident. You have to be confident in who you are as a person. Oh! <laughs> Notable quotable from Molly. Oh yeah. That's great. Sorry, someone is apparently uh, rebuilding the Goshen Theater for the fourth time uh, right outside my door. So, you know, that's live theater for you folks. Uh, what about you, Miss Katie? What's uh, where's the time where you learned confidence or built confidence through doing theater? Uh, I think all of my confidence has been built through performance, and here's why: it, going through school, so you had the oral book reports, right? Became a different character. Did wasn't me. Um, I was a shy kid. Let's preface all of this with I was a shy kid, um, but I love to perform. And to this day, I would much rather perform in front of hundreds of people as someone else than have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. It's an anxiety thing, and it's because you make yourself someone else on stage, essentially. I can put myself away, who I'm not always the most confident person, and be this other person, and then it it appears as if I'm confident. So I feel like my confidence is very much a, a fake it till you make it kind of lie kind of situation. Um, and that's how I've always operated. So like in school, you had the oral book reports, you had um, those creative moments where I took my theater aspects and used it for my homework and for my projects to get by because I knew that 
I had to do this or that if I was going to do this, I was going to do it so that it was spectacular. Um, we would do the how to speeches, how, how to do something. And mine was always a dance routine that I had done. Um, so I would break down the dances for my class and I would perform the dance for them kind of situation. So I figured out ways to appear confident, even though I myself was not super confident because I used my performance aspect of my life to get by. So really, it's my stepping stone to confidence. <laughs> it's all a fake it till you make it. If you're one of my students, you've heard me say this. So you don't always that. have to be confident. You just have to appear confident. I love that. You know who used to do that? Carol Burnett. She would go yeah. do situations as other people. She talks about that in her uh, memoir, uh, one more time. I am, yeah, I, I mean, I would cry yeah. if my parents sent me up to get like ketchup packets at McDonald's, guys. Like, I, I wouldn't even want to talk to the workers. That's yeah. how bad my anxiety was as a kid. And like, obviously, as you get older, you learn to cope with it and you just do it. But so. yeah, you get ketchup all the time now. I'm super proud. Yeah, thank you. Asking for change. Oh, guys. <laughs> Paul, what about you? Um, yeah, this, I, I think. Um, this is a really interesting, I've always found the word confidence inter interesting because um, I think of uh, the word confide, which is the, which is, you know, related. I wouldn't say it's the, the parent word or whatever. I don't know the terminology. Um, it's, but to tell someone something in confidence, um, that there's a sort of a secrecy about confidence um it in my mind and i think it plays to what katie said about fake it till you make it that the secret it you know i think this is the second time we've made this reference but the result of this deception is very hard to tell for when i fool the people i fear i fool myself as well right uh, oscar hammerstein Wait, and the king are we are we moving away from sondheim and going back a generation <laughs> well, but, uh, to hammerstein um, you know, Hammerstein, I mean, we wouldn't have Sondheim without Hammerstein. It's true. If Hammerstein had been the world's greatest plumber, Sondheim would today be the world's greatest plumber. Um, so, so when I was 20 years old, uh, I, for the first time in my life, had my own apartment. Um, I was living off campus during college. Um, and that meant that when classes ended for the summer, and I didn't have to be at school, I still had an apartment in that town and rent was still due. And so I said, this summer, I'm going to make my rent as a musician for the first time in my life. I'm going to, I'm going to try this. Um, and I, I applied for a job as a music director for a musical theater review with the community theater in Connecticut. Um, that would have covered my entire rent for the summer for two months rent. Great, great gig to have. Um, and they said, and, and they asked for an interview and to bring into the interview a medley of musical theater opening numbers that they chose. They said, anyone who comes in for an interview, bring this. I And they, they told, they called and told me that I did not get the job because they worried about me being too young. Then they said, but we loved your medley and we'd love to talk to you more about using it or pieces of it in our show. So that was a moment for me that was actually confidence, a confidence booster that I was able to say, I know I have what it takes. Clearly they liked what, the, what I gave them. So I know I'm good at this they're just gonna miss out because they think that I can't run a room. And I later booked a show that summer that did pay my rent that uh, we had people from, you know, 18, 19, all the way into their 60s. It was a huge cast, lots of people, and I ran the room. And at the end of it, we were all talking, I don't remember how it came up, but when I said that I was 20, everyone in the cast was flabbergasted they all thought I was much older and then blah 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 and I that was a, a I was in New York too so it felt like a really legitimate a nice gig um I guess the point is for me confidence is about 
secret. I didn't tell anyone that I was 20. I just walked in and I said, this is who I am. Um, I am the music director and you listen to me. Um, and it didn't matter that I was 20. Um, yeah, it's a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's all a show folks, just uh, smoke and mirrors. Um, but if you believe in it, others will believe in it. Um, which I, uh, in some ways brings us into the next aspect, I think, of what, uh, what we were going to talk about here. So if, if you all don't mind, I'll, I'll sort of transition because I think it, um, the last two things we talked about, creativity and confidence, I think both are crucial in the next segment, which is uh, problem solving, which we talk about a lot in in theater in general. Um, and we've talked about earlier in this episode. Um, so I'm gonna throw it to Miss Amber. Um, it's your turn to tell, tell us a story. Oh my goodness. Did we lose the chat window, y'all? No. Oh my goodness. Okay, so it's just very dramatic here. <laughs> we lost our internet connection briefly and I completely lost Zoom. I was trying to fill for time. No, for one, no one would have noticed because Paul covered like a pro. Katie and I both went. <laughs> <laughs> it's all like Amber about. disappears and Paul's just like, all right, here we go. <laughs> all about confidence. Finally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is my talk now. <laughs> putting it back in there. So uh, yeah, confidence, it's an interesting thing. And I love the thing that you say about confiding in someone, because it's about having the confidence to know that the thing that you're saying to that person is going to stay between the two of you. So having confidence in someone else, having confidence in yourself, I think that theater teaches both things. So one of the things, and this is like semi-related, this isn't like personal confidence, because I feel pretty good about personal confidence. Uh, but about having confidence in other people. Um, I've always, like, I don't have any siblings, so I've always had issues kind of trusting people and not... Oh, I think if you would have had siblings, you would have that problem, too. Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one of the things that theater taught me is how much I can trust uh, the people that I am doing theater with and, like, building that family with people you're creating art with is super important. So uh, like, I remember there have been so many times in my life where I've forgotten a line or something has gone wrong and the audience would never know because I was able to have a confidence in my fellow performers. They weren't able to have confidence in me and we were all working together for the same thing. So I think that secondary learning object objective of being confident is great. And I think it's just as important as having confidence in others. Uh, and that's definitely something that I have learned through theater. Uh, number three on our list today is problem solving, uh, which I kind of just alluded to. Uh, there have been so many times when I have had to solve ridiculous problems. Like uh, when we did Beauty and the Beast, I was in a teapot costume that was very heavy and it affected my center of gravity. And also it was a sphere because it's a teapot. So people didn't really register that I was a person in it because it looked like kind of a set piece. It was big and unwieldy. So normally if someone's in your way, you might touch their arm to be like, hey, I mean, back before COVID, you might touch somebody's arm and be like, oh, hello, I must pass, especially backstage. Like you sort of take your space. People would touch or move my, my teapot spout and because my center of gravity was crazy and they didn't realize that by pushing so high on my center of gravity with even just a little bit of force, it would just <laughs> knock me over. Uh, and then I couldn't get up on my own. The costume was so big that they had to fly me in and out of it. I would have to stand on a mark and it was blown up uh, by the ceiling and someone would lower it on a rope onto me. And then I had to like shimmy into it. That's how big it was. So I would like fall on the ground and we had to come up with a bunch of creative ways to get me up off of the ground. That's not something that you use in your everyday life. Like if you're inside a giant sphere and you fall down, how do you get back up again? But there's a metaphor there, I'm sure. Uh, 
but you're going to be called upon to solve some of the oddest, most interesting problems, and it really does make your brain a thinking, problem-solving brain. What's uh, what's an example for you, Miss Katie, of a time when you have had to solve a creative problem? Uh, changing out microphones while someone is doing a quick change. Uh, that's happened to me multiple times, and uh, it, you have to know what the, what's happening in the scene change so you cannot get ran over by set pieces while you're doing it. Uh, you have to know exactly how long you have to get it on that person's body and get them zipped into their costume so that they can get back on the stage so that their scene partner's not freaking out, wondering what's going on. Because uh, sometimes that person doesn't even know. Like, you're hiding behind a pillar, ready for their quick change, and they have no idea their microphone's gone out, and you're just, like, ripping things off their body. They never question it. They just go with it. Yeah, zip them up, and they go. Um I worked in a costume shop in college and I was actually helping backstage, not as a costume person, but just, um, I had inserted myself into the process cause I didn't get cast. <laughs> I had, I had auditioned for cabaret. I was, uh, yeah, it was the end. Of, well, okay. Yes. This is actually a kind of good idea. Making your own, um, your own venues. Uh, so I was, it was the end of my junior year. I had yet to do a musical for our main stage productions at college. I felt woefully underprepared to go into my senior year and not understand what exactly is expected to, of me as a performer in a professional setting. Um, and I ended up making it through callbacks and then I ended up not, not booking the part. And uh, I was devastated, but I took a few hours to cry. And then I emailed the professor who was directing it for that semester. And I said, I don't know if you have an assistant director, like a student director. I don't know if you have any openings on crew. Uh, I don't care if it's just to observe during rehearsals, but I want to be there so that I'm learning. And she's like, I don't know what we're going to do, but I love this idea. So I I showed up on the first day of rehearsals when the semester started back up and uh, I just kind of never left. And I, I just kind of ran backstage. I wasn't a stage manager, but I, I, they came up with a name for me because there's not a real title for what I was doing. I was basically just doing anything and everything, but, uh, what? It's a production associate. Yeah, something like that. Running, running crew manager or something. I don't know. Um, but at some point, our lead, our ingenue, came off stage for a quick change in her costume. The zipper broke. And she's about to walk out. And I had safety pins uh, lying at my station, which was right about there. And I just safety pinned her up. And then another night, some kind of headpiece that she had broke. And nobody knew what to do backstage. But I worked in the costume shop, which is a walk through to the dressing rooms anyway. So I ran upstairs real fast. I fixed her headpiece and I ran back down in time to get it on her head before her next scene. And everybody was just like, how'd you know where everything was? I was like, well, I work in the costume shop. So, <laughs> so it's just be being on your toes, being ready for anything. Um, missed lines, uh, contacts popping out of your eyeballs. Like you change your choreography. You sprain an ankle in a Chicago show uh, doing a stepper because all you do in that show is work out and you end up on the floor during the opening number and you crawl your way, making it funny across the stage for your song. Like you figure it out and you adjust. I don't know what else to say is you just make it happen. I want to know what, who in Cabaret had a headpiece on their costume? I think it but. was one of the, one of the girls, like um, one of the, just the dancers girls. I don't know. Okay. For the club, the Kit Kat girls. Very elaborate. Yeah. Who knows? I don't remember that far. This undergrad <laughs> club in Berlin bore a striking resemblance to the Ziegfeld Follies. Uh, Nailed it. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. The Sally Bowles Follies. <laughs> Molly, what about you? Problem solving. Ooh, that, like, listening to all of your stories, Katie, made me think of so many too. So I'll try and narrow it down but I think like at the end of the day like Katie was saying you 
you just make it happen and you don't complain and you stay cool, calm and collected. And if you do all of those things, a lot of people are going to hire you because a lot of people don't do those things. And um, people want to hire smart actors that are going to handle those situations really well. One that happened to me recently was uh, Tech Week of Into the Woods was super busy. We put the show up in about two weeks and um, just a lot of the tech elements we were still really working on up until like our preview performance, which happens a lot of the time. Um, So we had a preview performance. It technically wasn't opening night, but we did have an audience. Uh, A lot of our people's friends and family were there and that sort of thing. So we got to Hello Little Girl, which is, I play Little Red Riding Hood, so it was me and the wolf. And um, something, just like something went wrong with the lights. It happens. And all of the lights were completely different uh, and they weren't lighting the entire stage like they were supposed to. Like it was either everything was red, which it was supposed to be for part of the song, or there was one small light on stage right. And the chore- our choreography was like all over the stage. So we adjusted the entire song to dance in that one pool of light and we made it work. And I was like, I bet so many people noticed. I was so worried about it. I texted my mom at intermission because she was at the show. And I was like, I'm so like, I I wish you could have seen it. The lighting was off, like something happened. And she was like, I literally had no idea. (laughs) And so it's just like, it's just not even that big of a deal at the end of the day. Like it's pretty low stakes. Just be ready for anything to happen and adjust and then be like, okay, that happened. It's fine. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) that's my story. I love it. I love it. Love it. Uh, Paul, what about you? Yeah. I mean, if we're all telling horror stories about when things went dreadfully wrong. (laughs) We've already done that. We have a whole episode. I know. I know. Um, Yeah. No. um, So Problem solving. No, I had something good. And then these wonderful stories all made me think of other things. Um, What was the thing I was going to talk about, though? Well, that is a good question. And I'm going to keep stalling for time until it comes to me. I'll tell I'll tell one story that came to me while they were uh, talking and maybe halfway through that uh, the original concept will pop back into my head. Um, When I was uh, at the Round Barn Theater last year, um, two years ago, two years ago, um, I keep, I feel like I keep going back to that show. Things happened on that show. Um, uh, one of the things was my almost brand new pair of tap shoes, uh, broke. The screws kept falling out of the right toe. And by the final performance, I was down to one screw, which meant that it would not stay in place, which meant, so yeah, I think you were there, Amber, for this performance. So I had like, thrown some glue on it a couple hours before and put a clamp on it just to like hope that that would hold it just for the one number that I needed my taps for. And uh, I went out there and I was like very gingerly stepping on it. And um, within 10 seconds, it was just spinning around my toe. And I had to, like Molly said, adjust the choreography. Um, You talk about um, keeping a cool head. We all, we've all mentioned that. And I think that is, um, it always brings me back to the uh, motto, and I don't know where it originated, but slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Um, so if you can keep that cool head, because it's, I promise you, what might seem like an eternity to you, like you have to hurry because all this time is passing, is the blink of an eye to anyone else. Um, so yeah, keeping that cool head and saying, I can take another one second to process what's going on. Um, That was it. It was looking at it from a different perspective. That's how you problem solve. I'm getting there. It's going away again. I don't know. Unfortunately, y'all are going to be robbed of some brilliance because I cannot remember what it was about. But it's 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 basically problem solving comes back to creativity. Comes back to look at the look at it from another perspective. Look at it. Picture it rotated. Think of it another way. Um, And that's what I've learned in the theater. Think of it some other way. That's so smart. I think the we're going to cover two more of these in today's episode. This next one is perseverance. Um, and I know that like this one might be a little bit weird because you think of you think of like the shows that you do in school or the shows you do for your civic theater or your professional shows. The great thing about theater is that it's temporary. And as much as you love a show, that show's eventually going to end. 
and you'll have had that beautiful memory or the opposite of that. Sometimes shows aren't exactly what you want them to be or you don't get along with everybody, but guess what? It's only temporary. So that's one of the things that is all about theater. So you would not think about how you develop perseverance through something that's so uh, temporary in your life, something that passes through your life so quickly. Uh, but let me tell you, there have been so many times that I have like wanted to learn something, tried and tried and tried and tried. Like it has happened more in theater than in any other thing that I have done in my life. So for example, when we did Mary Poppins, there is a tap combination of Mary Poppins that is not easy. And being Mary Poppins, and have, it's in Step in Time, I had to do a tap solo in Step in Time, and there's a call and response section. I had to learn it, had to. And I spent so many hours trying to learn this tap combination. When I did Kiss Me Kate, there is a fight in Kiss Me Kate, and it's stage combat. I had to learn that stage combat routine, and we worked and worked and worked and were tenacious with doing that routine. I have wanted to do a double pirouette, clean, perfect double pirouette my whole life. This one, I'm still working on, but I still work on it. I still do the exercises, even though naturally I am not a great spinner or turner in dance because I don't have like the necessary anatomy to do it, but I still want to do it. The thought that I don't have the necessary anatomy to do something, but I have the core belief that if I work hard on it, maybe someday before I shuffle off this mortal coil, I will be able to do a clean double anytime I want. I still core belief believe this because theater has taught me that perseverance pays off. Uh, what do you think, Katie? What's, uh, what's something that you've had to persevere in in your theater skills? Well, I think, I think the obvious is it's just like in theater, we are told no more times than we will ever be told yes. And so it's inherently, you have to have perseverance if you want to do theater because you have to be willing to keep coming back and getting slapped in the face, essentially. <laughs> Even in school. And it's like, yep. people talk about this, like it's just in the profession. It's in school. It's at civic theater. It's uh, like semi-professional theater or professional theater at any time, anywhere that you could ever do theater you're going to be rejected, or the thing that you want isn't gonna be the right thing for the whole production, even if you're perfect and amazing. And it's not about you, it's not about your talent, it's all about the fact that it is a whole big puzzle that they're putting together. You might not get what you want out of it, but you gotta persevere because the arc of theater curves toward fulfillment. Like, overall, you're gonna have a beautiful, wonderful experience, even though you may not be cast as Maria Von Trapp. And it may never happen, Paul. But yeah, perseverance. It's, it takes perseverance to have to, to do this, even as a hobby, even as something in your education. Yep. I yeah, love I, all Go ahead, Paul. No, I just love that you said it may never happen. Not that it will never happen. And that's that persevering spirit. Right. I think it's also uh, something to note is if you are not finding success within your school or um or in that community theater that you find ways to create anyway that is a type of perseverance so last story i just shared about college i don't think that was the last story i shared one of the stories i shared about the fact that like i inserted myself into the process of this musical in college so that i could learn what a professional setting looks like so that I was ready when it was my turn. Um, so, and then that next semester I booked Sweeney Todd for school for my senior year and the payoff is great. You know, if I didn't get cast all, all four years up until my senior year, but the payoff was Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd done every time, every right. time. So uh, it is just like being, being willing to put the work in to make it happen, no matter which way it happens, is a type of perseverance. Um, so yeah, just keep working. I loved Amber that um, that you shared your double pure journey 
because it made me think of when I was younger and still doing gymnastics. I, I was about to go into high school and I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue doing it. And that was the year that I finally got my front handspring. I had been doing gymnastics for like eight years and I had finally gotten my front handspring by recital time. And then I quit. I was like, all right, this is where I walk away. I'm walking away with my held high, held high. Cause, cause honestly, I'm not built for gymnastics, guys. I, I'm not, my body is not, it's never been a gymnast body. <laughs> And, uh, and doing a front handspring for my body type was huge. Like, I'm sure there are women who accomplish a lot more with my body type, but I knew I was not going to be that person and that my talents were going to be used somewhere else during school. So I was like, all right, got my front handspring and now I'm done. Walked away when I knew it was right. Top of the game. Exit. Top of my game. Bye bye. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, Paul, perseverance. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm doing this a lot, but I love the word persevere, that it doesn't mean, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean keep going till you get it. It doesn't mean um, keep focus, you know, keep doing one specific thing. It just means keep going. Um, Again, going into the etymology of it, per and severe. Per, uh, from, from the Latin, uh, that prefix means just very. And severe, strict. So very, very focused, very. It just means continuing. It doesn't mean improving. It doesn't mean... All, all it means is that you continue to exist on your journey. Um, now, obviously... Improvements will come, growth will come, but that is not the goal of perseverance. And I think it's one of the simultaneously easiest and hardest things about this business is perseverance. Because on paper, continue to exist, done, right? Continue to exist in my field, just, you know, and then the problem is all of the obstacles that are thrown in your way, both literal and figurative in your own mind of why am I doing this and is it worth it and all that. Um, but all, all you have to do is keep answering that question, yes, and continue to exist. When I'm, uh, the first thing that I thought of when I saw the word perseverance when we were talking about this episode was writing, because I'm doing a lot of it right now. And there are so many times when uh, we will be sitting, I'll be sitting at a piano, my brother with his dad, and um, you'll just sit there in silence and continue to exist until something comes to us. Sometimes you have to sit back and wait for the thing to come to you. And sometimes I'll just noodle. I will play any random notes in any order. It doesn't matter. Maybe I'll find something. I'll play anything that my hands are comfortable in. All it is is continuing to exist. And I think there's a little bit of faith that that continuing to exist will, um, you know, bring you some reward, uh, some kind of, there's some kind of pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. So, Simultaneously, the easiest and hardest thing to do. Nothing can continue to exist against I, all uh, I have an external story, and this is a story that takes place back in the 1960s. It's obviously not mine, but uh, it was a story that was published in the New York Times after the death of Tiny Tim. Uh, Tiny Tim, the performer, not the fictional character from A Christmas Carol. Uh, so there was a show that was called Laugh-In, and uh, there was this sort of quirky character actor guy named Tiny Tim and his big shtick or Lotsie for you drama club kids, you should remember what Lotsie is from theater history. His Lotsie was that he played the ukulele and he sang Tiptoe Through the Tulips. That was his thing. So a friend of a friend who had published this article in the New York Times went to every audition that she could. And every time she went to an audition, she saw this guy with the ukulele, this like six foot three, stringy, greasy haired, quirky guy with his ukulele. And she was like, he's at literally every audition that I go to, it doesn't matter what it, what it is for. And she decided to like bring it up. She's like, who's this guy? So he was kind of like a New York City legend among actors because everybody was like, uh, have you run into that ukulele guy at your audition? And people started to know his name because also his like headshot, it said Tiny Tim on the front, like odd, what an odd person. So he became this sort of legend among actors. She talked to someone else about it and said, hey, uh, who, have you seen this ukulele guy? They're like, oh yeah, 
he was at this call for uh, this Shakespeare show that I did. And then he was also at this call for this Broadway musical. He would go to everything that had a listing. So come to find out later, she came to find out later that he literally would walk into the room at every single audition he attended and play and sing, tiptoe through the tulips with his ukulele. No sheet music for the accompanist, no monologue, no requested song, walk in, cattle call, tiptoe through the tulips, leave. That's what he did. I love it. And that's it, yeah, exactly. So he kind of became this sort of legend. If he'll be like, oh, Tiny Tim is here, tiptoe through the tulips, tra la la. He gets cast on Laughing, a variety program, which is on television at the time. They put him on TV. People are like, this is quirky and crazy, but then everybody kind of got in on the joke. Tiptoe Through the Tulips was released on record, became a number one single. Everybody was super in on the joke. Now, to the point where Tiptoe Through the Tulips, sung by Tiny Tim, is used in an entire horror movie franchise as the clown at midnight concept because it's this like cheery thing. He never stopped doing that one thing. He knew who he was, he knew what he did, he knew what his shtick was, and that's all he did. I think I think it was also like a popular sound on Vine, if I'm yeah. remembering correctly. Yeah, he's like, that's tenacity. After his death, this one shtick that he started doing in the 60s still lives on. He's, it's still here. And there was a, in, in, I feel like I've been talking about Urinetown in our episodes a lot lately, but there's a character in Urinetown loosely based on, not on him exactly, but his type. It's a tall dude. It was played by Rick Crome in the original, and the character's name is Tiny Tom. Just I love that. Oh, so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the tenacity. That's the perseverance that we're talking about, and like, it's a, uh, it's a fascinating thing. Molly, I know that like, we haven't talked to you about perseverance. Chat with us about how you've learned perseverance through doing the drama. Yeah. Um, I was think it was really making me think about like listening to all of you talk too, was just like this time in the world right now. And I think perseverance is something that we're all learning in a very real way and it's very different for everyone and I'm not even saying people should be persevering by like trying to perform right now that's like not what I mean but I don't know I think there's just something really powerful about learning that sometimes you're just gonna be home and you can't do anything but in the grand scheme of your life let's say coronavirus lasts the rest of this year and then maybe it stops. Let's say it lasts longer. Either way, the grand scheme of your life, that's not that long of a time. Like thinking about like how long you've already been alive and like hopefully how long you will be afterwards. I think that, and now I feel like I'm getting like really deep, but like I, I just, I really feel like this time is transforming a lot of people's lives in ways that might not be known for a while. And I think that that is really scary. And I think that there is something to be said for letting yourself feel that. I'm like getting emotional, like letting yourself feel that and then persevere through it. I don't think perseverance is always the prettiest flower in the, in the garden. Um, and it doesn't even mean like trying to do theater constantly all the time. Maybe sometimes it's knowing I need to take a step away right now because where I'm at, I'm home with my family and I'm going to be home. And to me, like that is perseverance. So yeah, I don't know. That's kind of what it made me think about. And I feel like I had all these other things to say, but I really just started thinking about that and kind of reflecting on that in my own life. Um, yeah, I, I think it's hard. And I think it's something that we're constantly learning and evolving through. And I don't think that we'd be ourselves without the perseverance we've already gone through. And I don't think that we'd become who we're going to be without the perseverance that is yet to happen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this is right it's now, we're, we're kind of a culture of perseverance right now. We are trying to stay constant and stay steady in a very uncertain world. And it's not just the pandemic. There's so much social unrest and political division. And I know that we don't talk about this stuff very often, kids, 
Uh, but we know that you feel it. All of our eight to 14 year old campers that are watching this, their families and other folks, like we know what you're going through and we are not through Table Talks attempting to ignore all of those things. We are right now through Table Talks persevering and staying connected through theater and through talking about theater, persevering together through this virus, through this unrest, through even our disagreements with each other and finding strength in each other through this time. And I think that that's like, this is a great like final uh, topic for today's episode. Uh, but it's things like this that help us to persevere. Uh, comments, Katie, Paul? I was just gonna say that uh, theater, you know, this is not the first time that the world has faced a pandemic like this. This is not the first time that theater itself has been affected by that. And theater finds a way to persevere. And that happens because it's a community. It's a livelihood. It's, it is who we are as people. And people, maybe not everybody, but people in general find a way to persevere. And our community, because we are uh, very much empathetic within our community, because we have to be, because we play other people and we have to empathize with our characters and learn something new from a different perspective, we automatically tend to empathize with people a lot strong, stronger. Um, and I think that that is why we as a community, the theater community will persevere. It may, be t it may take a while to get us back uh, running smoothly and where we wanna be, but uh, theater I think will always find a way to persevere because it is made up of people who have been taught through theater how to persevere. Uh, and it's a, it's a hard world, it's a hard life, uh, but we're gonna make it somehow. <laughs> you know, if, if movies didn't take the theater down, this global pandemic ain't gonna do it. <laughs> Paul, comments, yeah. thoughts? I, I mean, you know, Katie, you've really just sort of exemplified what I was thinking. I don't know if everyone else knew this, but Jurassic Park is going off of Netflix very soon. So I I was watching it the other night. Um, and it was really, really meaningful to, to see Jeff Goldblum. I know it's cliche, but the moment where he says, life uh, finds a way. Um, and that's, that's theater and that's life. That's, that's, Exactly right. Uh, you know, I think Margaret, the people talk about the, uh, the Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, talking about the signs of civilization being uh, the broken femur bone. I don't know if you know that story, but look it up because it's beautiful. But um, I, I actually disagree. I'm no anthropologist. But I think that the moment that we became, maybe not a civilization, but the moment we became more than just sentient beings and actually a, a, a collective and a civilization, I guess, um, is the thing that brings us all together. And that is a good story that someone, they, they went out hunting woolly mammoth or whatever, um, clearly not an anthropologist. They went out hunting and it was a really good hunt and they came back and they painted a picture on the cave and told everybody about it. People love a good story and storytelling is, I think, the most universal human need, you know, aside from water, shelter, air, stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's for that reason that I, I have no fear that, that theater and the arts in general are going to persevere and probably are going to be the thing that really kind of gets us through this, has been gets through this. Think of how many people have gone to create art, to make music, uh, from this, think of uh, how much time is spent on your, you know, cleaning up your Netflix queue because you've got so much time at home, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's important to remember that you guys as theater people, us as theater people, our students as theater people, we've already got the tools to sort of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps through this. Not to say that you gotta be cool all the time because I know I'm not. Like there are days, uh, that are tough, but I think the other great thing that we're really good at because we've been training our brains and training our skills is we're really good at expressing those emotions or recognizing them when they come up and recognizing their roots and saying, okay, I need some self-care time or I need to go break something or I need to call my grandma or whatever it is. We're, we're pretty good at that emotional assessment and uh, 
that's all to do with being theater people. So there's, there's a lot of advantages that we have in this time as theater people. Um, and I would encourage you guys not just to share your love of theater with other people, but share these skills with other people too, because there's, uh, there's folks who don't have the advantages that we have of having developed perseverance, of having developed these problem solving skills and this emotional intelligence. A lot of people, particularly among the, amongst the cohort of our students, don't have those skills on the level that our students do. So uh, share them as much as you can, guys. Uh, and on that note, this has been episode 17 of Goshen Theater Drama Club Table Talks. Molly took it deep and we just dug it in deeper. We got our shovels out, Paul with his backhoe, Katie with the excavator. Those are the names of the equipment that I know. <laughs> Uh, so we have enjoyed today. If you guys have questions or comments on today's episode, please let us know. Next week, episode 18, we're going to be talking about some more secondary skills that you learn in the theater. Uh, we would love to hear if there's any secondary skills that you guys have learned or that you would love for us to talk about. We can fold those in next week. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, as always, Goshen Noon Kiwanis for supporting Gershon Theater Drama Club. I don't know what just happened. Uh, thank you for supporting Goshen Theater Drama Club. We couldn't do it without you. Special thanks today to Miss Katie and Miss Molly and Paul. Thank you guys so much for being here. This was a blast. Did you guys have a good time? Always. Always. Always and forever. Paul, I know you're not one of our regular panelists, obviously, because you're not a Goshen Theater Drama Club staffer. You're just some guy that shows up every week. Some homeless man in New York City that we just picked up. <laughs> with a <super> care. <laughs> uh, but uh, since we're not done with the list, you think maybe you could, I don't know, join us next week for episode 18? You know, I'm remodeling my bathroom. So if we can work around that, then, then yeah, I think we can so do that. So that's a no. Okay, well, it's been fun. <laughs> we had a good run. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Tune in next week for episode 18, more secondary skills that you learn when you're a theater kid. We hope you had a great time. Have a great week, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.